Welcome to Nerd World History. Now, this is a new channel. My other two channels that I have, which there are linked to below, are dedicated to films and sci-fi trivia and lore. This is a much more factual-based channel. It's very new at this point, if you're tuning in when this video was released. Um, if you do like it, please like, share, and subscribe down below. As I'm trying to grow this channel, please check out my other two channels if you think you might be interested in Star Trek or movie history, horror films, etc. And like, share, and subscribe over there too. In this video, I'm going to be looking at Second World War tanks, specifically six tanks that I think are just awesome. Not necessarily the six best tanks of the Second World War, not the most ubiquitous maybe, but tanks that I think are just the coolest. Now, just before we get into this video, let me clarify, I am not a historian, but I am someone with a great passion for and love of history. And hopefully that will translate in my videos. So these are more of a discussion piece. I'll include events and history and dates, but for the most part, most of my videos are going to be a discussion of history and events, characters and places which take my interest and hopefully take yours as well. With that said, let's get started. At number six, I'm going to start out with the British Comet Tank. Arguably, and often debated, as the best British tank fielded during the Second World War, although it didn't really see service until right at the end. Went in at Normandy, had a few battles in 45, nothing spectacular, didn't have a lot of post-war use, but it was, again, arguably, and actually my personal opinion, one of, if not the best, British tanks produced during the Second World War. It was supposedly equal to a German Panther or Russian T-34. It was equipped with a 75mm gun, it had very good armor, great cross-country performance. It was a descendant of the Cromwell tank, which was, again, arguably one of Britain's best tanks, easily as good, if not better, than the German Panzers. Uh, Panzer IV, for example. A larger gun, better armor. These tanks were all very good and very modular. Many of the, Cr the Cromwell tanks, for example, were part of Hobart's funnies, not just the Shermans as were several Churchill tanks. But the Comet was the best all-rounder British-produced tank of the Second World War. Fortunately, not many of them have survived into the modern age, although I do believe a couple of them have been restored now. Okay, at number five, bit of a cheat. It's not technically a tank. To be technical, it is a self-propelled anti-tank gun the M10 Achilles specifically. The M10 was actually originally an American tank which the British used during the Second World War but they removed and modified the turret put on a bigger gun which is another 76.2 millimeter cannon the same as on the Comet. This thing was it actually had an open topped turret which you know you won't want to be in that thing if a plane went over. Messerschmitt flying over you you're dead. Um, off topic. The tank had very good armor, excellent armor, excellent suspension, it weighed about 30 tons. The gun could take up pretty much anything and was one of the few tanks that could really go up against the Tiger. Could actually stand a chance of knocking it out without being obliterated itself, like a column of Sherman's might be. Uh, this tank, plus things like the, the Sherman Firefly, carried the largest guns. They basically had the same gun. The British took an American tank, swapped out the turret so it could put in a bigger gun, and refielded it. The M10 Achilles is an excellent example of this. Uh, it's not one of the more famous tanks, I don't think, of the Second World War, but I remember seeing one once, and I remember when I first read about them and not really knew what they were when I did a lot of research on Second World War tanks on and off over the years. It's one that always stood out to me. It's a beautiful design. It's a good marriage of both American and British engineering to produce something better than either country would have produced on their own at that time. And it performed its well and 
performed its duties rather and performed very well during the Second World War. Despite its size and weight, the Achilles was actually pretty fast, clocked at 32 miles per hour for a Second World War tank, especially one of its size, that's pretty, pretty fast. It also was an improvement over some other tanks in that it had a diesel engine, which wasn't always the best idea to have a petrol engine in your tank, as the Tommy Cookers will testify, as the Germans nicknamed the Shermans during the war, because of their propensity to just explode when hit. This is not just an example of them learning that petrol engines explode when they're hit, it's a cost thing. That people carried on using petrol engines during the Second World War. They weren't stupid. They did it because we had more petrol and we had diesel. It was easier to field petrol powered vehicles than it was diesel. Otherwise, the vehicles would all grind to a halt and the tank's useless unless you can move it. All things considered, again, the Achilles, fantastic tank destroyer. At number four, we've got the Soviet T-34, one of my personal absolute favorite tanks of the Second World War. It is the perfect example, and I mean the perfect example of Russian engineering. Very rough, very ready, but it works. It's like slapped together. These things were so poorly made that and they were all welded together, which was actually quite a good thing. But they were, they were so poorly made, there were sometimes gaps in the armor. These things were really, really, really crude. But like all things of that, <laughs> of that type, they worked. Big gun, thick armor. They also had sloped armor, which basically doubled the thickness of the armor. They had a good use during the Second World War. They were developed in the pre-war years, used all the way through the Second World War. They built, I think, more of these things than they built Shermans. It's kind of, it's ridiculous how many of the Russians managed to churn out of these tanks. And they were faster, more powerful than almost anything the Germans were fielding, with the exception of the Tiger. These things could easily stand up to the, pan the Panzer threes and the Panzer IV, they were nothing to it. Shells would bounce off. The Germans got a, a shock at battles like Kursk and stuff when these things went out there and just laid waste to them. The T-34 was, as I say, it was crudely engineered, but beautiful tank. Its simplicity, its function over form, brutalistic ideology it's so soviet so russian and so magnificent that I, I can't praise this tank enough it is a fantastic vehicle it's not something um, a country like the united states britain or france or germany would make because no offense to russians it's just kind of like the, the we can't we over-engineer things. It has to be right. They didn't care if this thing was right or wrong as long as it worked. And work it did. And it worked itself all over the German panzer divisions and all across Germany. This is a brutal tank. Again, equivalent to some of the best tanks produced on both sides. Although, again, the Russians did it first. They were building these things in 1940. We didn't build the Comet until 45. Five years later, this thing had more or less all the way around it in its important areas 45 47 well between 40 and 47 millimeters of armor again slopes it was a bit stronger it had a 76.2 millimeter gun again top of the range gun only really beaten by things like the tiger and the king tiger which is in the name that they they beat everything um it had good suspension almost 30 miles an hour i think it was 26 miles per hour I believe this tank's maximum speed it was easily a match for the best that the Allies had and the only thing the Germans had that could beat it was the Tiger I mean truly beat it they had things that equaled it but the only thing that really really built beat it was the Tiger as a tank otherwise you're looking at dedicated anti-tank guns like the 88 and a few other things, or you know, rockets deployed from a aircraft, but this thing had machine guns to take care of them as well. It was a fantastic tank, and quite frankly, nothing the Italians or Japanese had came even close to it.
At number three, we've got the Churchill tank. This was something of a relic of a design. When this tank was first envisioned, the British believed that the Second World War might follow a similar trend to the First World War, and they wanted to be ready for it. So this tank is unusually long, designed for crossing trenches. That kind of war never happened. It was a tank that in the First World War would have been brilliant, but in the Second World War was okay. It did have very good armor. It was, again, very modular. Hobart's funnies were good. You got flail tank versions of this thing. The Churchill Crocodile, which was a flamethrower tank. Nasty, nasty machine. It had an okay gun. It had good armor and was renowned for its cross-country and uphill capabilities, probably because of those massive tracks. In a sort of botched attack the British did during the Second World War to demonstrate to the Americans that attacking Fortress Europe was a bad idea, we had to leave several of these things behind. When the Germans found them and studied them, they thought that we basically used old inferior equipment, not something modern and state-of-the-art, but they, they were our modern state-of-the-art tanks. They were, though, very reliable and, as I said, very modular. And they were a good tank, although I did once read a quote that when Winston Churchill saw the tank's performance, he was a little insulted that such a mediocre tank had been named after him, although this tank went on to a lot of prominence in the post-war years, as well as being very useful, of course, during the Second World War. But these tanks also saw the, I think it was the Mark IVs, I think, saw service in the Korean War, where they were outstanding. Massively bigger gun, excellent cross-country, and Korea, kind of hilly. These things were excellent going up hills, which for a big heavy vehicle on tracks, I mean, if you drive, you know, sometimes a car strains going up a hill. So imagine how much a 30 ton monster of steel and ammunition is going to struggle. And these things were good at it. In terms of armor and firepower, these tanks had pretty heavy armor, easily 70 odd 80 millimeters of armor it depended on whereabouts on the tank you were looking at turret had very strong armor on it the early versions of this tank the mark one the mark two had two and six pounder guns respectively with the later models having 75 millimeter and up to a 95 millimeter gun later on in the later models the tank was an excellent tank built for a war that never happened but served very well all the same My number two choice is the Queen of the Desert herself, the Crusader. Now, this is another British tank, I know. I'm British, assume me. This tank was one of the main ones that was used at battles like El Alamein under Montgomery and had defeated the Italians in North Africa and would fight against Rommel. It was a decent tank. It had decent armor, but the early model only had a 40mm gun or a two-pounder. This gun was practically a pea shooter, as I once heard a veteran describe it. It had bounce off, particularly the German tanks, it couldn't get through them. Later, a 57mm or 6 pounder gun was added to this tank when it got a larger turret. But the tank's bigger problem wasn't necessarily just its gun. That's had pretty good armour, it had a Christie suspension system, which meant it was the most advanced, most modern suspension you could put on a tank at that time. And... It had, again, excellent cross-country performance. It was bloody fast. It was a beautiful tank to look at as well. And it could take a beating, but the problem was this thing had a tendency to like overheat. Its engine wasn't reliable. You used to lose more of these things to breakdowns than you did to enemy fire. That was the tank's biggest flaw. And of course, these problems were resolved as the years went on. And many of these problems occurred because the tank was rushed into service. The British, we needed tanks. After Dunkirk, we'd left a lot of our equipment in France. Although, to be fair, those were mostly Matildas. And those weren't, they weren't, they, they weren't the best. But they, the Crusaders were rushed into service before they really managed to get all the bugs out of them. They did get all the bugs out of them eventually. But the work went on the back burner when the Americans started to produce the Sherman in numbers. So that... We didn't really need to work on the Crusader. Plus, better tanks were coming, like the Cromwell tank, from the Churchill tank that I previously mentioned. These tanks were on the way, and we didn't really need the Crusader anymore. But she was a beautiful tank in the early war years. Second World War is a fantastic period for tanks. The amount of tank development. Normally, a tank, you might start it in, say, 1950. You won't see it in service till. 1960, 1965, something like that. During the Second World War, we went from pea shooters with machine guns on them, designed for crossing turrets, to the modern idea of a battle tank in things like the Tiger and the T-34s. 
and it's just an amazing amount of development to take place in such a short period of time and the beautiful thing is war is horrible but at least right now I get to look back on the beautiful engineering that was accomplished during that horrendous conflict. And I don't remember one spot, I'm sorry, it had to be the German Tiger. The biggest, baddest, meanest mother tank of the entire Second World War. Now the tank did have its flaws. It had, it had, it suffered from a typical German problem. Germans are fantastic engineers. They make things really well, but sometimes they make them a little too well. Too overthought out, overcomplicated. It had this overlapping wheel system that it meant it was very hard, plus with it combined that with the tank's weight, very hard to change the tracks. If a wheel was damaged, it was very hard to repair. The tank was massively over-engineered and had a few mechanical problems. But generally speaking, there was nothing that could get through its armor. It had the monstrous 88 millimeter gun. Its armor was just ridiculously thick. This tank weighed 60 odd tons, which is pretty much the same as a modern 21st century main battle tank. This was a, a beast of a tank. It was a Herculean vehicle, particularly for the Second World War. It outclassed everything. This thing was so big, so heavy, it couldn't even cross some bridges. You had to transport them by train. But once you got this thing into battle, some of the best tank aces of the Second World War could use these tanks to devastating effect. And yes, I'm looking at you, Michael Wittmann, one of the most successful tank commanders of the entire Second World War. He once came across an entire column of British Shermans and just obliterated them, taking out the front one, the back one, and just everything in the middle before they, even, they, they were, before they could even respond. He destroyed an entire column on his own with one tank. And it's not just the tank, that's that man being a brilliant tank commander but the accomplishment of the vehicle itself, over-engineered or not. If you want to be in any tank in the Second World War, you want to be something in something that's pretty much nigh indestructible, and that was this tank. It was very hard to knock out, very hard to destroy, and it usually took overwhelming numbers firing at point-blank range. When these things turned up on the battlefield, I can't, I can't imagine what it would have been like to have been in a Sherman or Churchill or even a T-34 going up against one of these things. It must have felt like a Chihuahua going against a Doberman, just nipping at its ankles, hoping its teeth don't turn round and snap your head off. Just so we've covered it, the tank had between 25 and 120 millimeters of armor, and that's the thickest armor of any tank really in the Second World War. It, of course, carried the dreaded 88mm tank-destroying gun. It had a maximum speed of pushing 30 mile an hour if it wasn't, you know, full of fuel and heavy armor and was on a good road. Heavy armor. It's more likely about 25 miles per hour. Still a decent speed for a tank that was so heavy and so large and so ridiculous. I don't know what it is with despots. They always look at it through history. Every time you get a despot in charge, a man like that boob that ran Germany back then, they always want bigger and more powerful, not always more practical. The Tiger suffered from being an impractical monster, but still magnificent a vehicle. Well, that's my six tanks of the Second World War. I am a little biased as I'm British and I know more about British tanks than I necessarily about, do about other peoples. Let me know in the comments below what tanks you would have picked for this list, what tanks you particularly like. This list wasn't really in any order. The, the Tiger is not necessarily my favorite tank of the Second World War. It varies depending on my conversation and my mood at the time. But these are the six tanks that always stand out to me as the best. And if anyone's wondering why the Sherman isn't on this list, I personally don't like it. I find it a completely inadequate tank and I know it's it was well engineered it was reliable it had many good points and good qualities to it but I don't believe in quantity over quality in my job outside of this I work 
to a degree in our catering industry and for me I would never produce low quality in large amounts before producing good quality in smaller doses and to me the Sherman is overproduced low quality and I'm sorry I know it has its people that love it and I do find it to be a very good tank but it doesn't make my personal list of tanks that I would want to be in in the Second World War. I would not want to be up against the Germans when they nicknamed the vehicle that I'm in a Tommy Cooker. That does not inspire my confidence in the vehicle that I'm in. That's just me. With all that said, please like, share, subscribe, comment down below, as I said, and bye-bye.